Okay, yeah, thanks. I mean, it's an immense honor and pleasure to speak here for Ofer Gaber. Uh, I have also profited from him in many ways. Um, I mean, like, if you want to test some idea and see whether it works or not, you just say two words and then you'll either fill in the details or tell you where the mistake is. Uh, and, okay, so I... I recently I've done some work on some kind of PADK theory, and I think I've never talked about this really. So I want to use this opportunity to speak about it here, as it's actually a couple of points related to work of Ofer. Um, so I'll slowly make my way to PADK theory, but uh, first I want to tell you how I like to think about algebraic K theory itself. So, uh, let's say R is any ring, and I mean, for me, a ring is always commutative, although, strictly speaking, it's not necessary right now. Um, then I have proj R, it's a category of finite projective R modules. Uh, but as a category, just with automorphisms. Uh, and so this thing here will be a groupoid, a category where all, all uh, <coughs> maps are isomorphisms. And uh, if you get used to thinking higher categorically, then groupoids are special kinds of spaces in the sense of Lurie. So these form an infinity category S. And uh, roughly what this means, this translation, is that you think about this category in the following way, that it takes a disjoint union over all projective R modules up to isomorphism. And then for each such, uh, it takes a classifying space of its automorphism group. And... Uh, well, there are certain very natural operations that you can do with projective R modules. For example, you can take the direct sum. And, well, I mean, this certainly turns, and this is, of course, some kind of commutative operation. It doesn't matter in which order you take the direct sum. <coughs> so this means that it turns projective modules up to isomorphism into a commutative monoid. <coughs> but actually, and this is somewhere where algebraic topology enters, there's a way to make the statement without passing to isomorphism classes. So, in fact, this thing itself, this groupoid, is a commutative monoid in spaces. And uh, let me put this in quotation marks. Uh, so technically, this is called an infinity monoid. Uh, where the infinity there means it's somehow commutative up to all orders. So in this higher categorical language, there is some uh, you can have more and more commutativity constraints, and infinity means it has all of them. And so they form an infinity category. Oh, we'll denote by monoids e infinity. Well, technically, maybe in spaces. S is the infinity category of spaces. Oh. Spaces. So space for me is a simplicial, uh, can simplicial set. Can complex. And so then there's this operation called group completion. So you have commutative groups. For some reason, you always say, I think, commutative monoid, but you say a being group. But anyway. um, uh, 
so this is a full subcategory of commutative monoids, and this has a left adjoint called group completion that you can also easily describe. So M maps to M group. And uh, the definition of the Grothendieck D group is that K0 of R is you take projective modules up to isomorphism and you group complete. <coughs> but what's this machinery from algebraic topology or higher category theory gives you is a way of saying that just the same words, but somehow omitting the passage to isomorphism classes in the process. So you actually have, so similarly, um, you somehow have infinity groups in spaces. It's for infinity subcategory of infinity monoids. So these are just all the guys such that if you look at the set of connected components that itself inherits the structure of a commutative monoid and you ask if this is a group. And so similarly this thing has a left adjoint. M group completion of M. Unfortunately, this turns out to be a bit harder to write down explicitly. And uh, so McQuillan gave some ways of doing this in terms of the plus construction. But I mean, it just abstractly it exists. And then I think this makes it very natural to make this definition that the <coughs> case theory of R is. Just takes this category or the groupoid of finite projective modules, which has this kind of commutative monoid structure given by addition, and you group complete in this higher categorical way. So this is an infinity group in spaces. So in particular, you can forget all everything about the group structure now, and in particular, it's a space. So it's community kind of. So the, the notion of uh, homotopy, commutative and associative up to higher thing, this is the same as the old thing of Graham Siegel, where he Right, so this is basically, I mean, basically Siegel explained how to do this in this. Yeah, but this was uh, much before the. Right, and so this is some kind of new reverting of what he did. But it's the same thing as what Siegel did. And there is also something called A infinity? Is uh, well, A infinity only makes sense for algebras and. Uh, this is some, uh, corresponds roughly to E1 here. So E1 would just mean associative. Uh, so, I mean, a non commutative monoid. Okay. So sometimes you have algebras, and algebras somehow have an addition and the multiplication. And so the addition implicitly, I think, is always E infinity. But then there's a multiplication which can have different levels of commutativity, which might be E1, which is so on. And E1 is sometimes also called A infinity then. Sorry. Uh, the case here of this is R, in particular, is homotopy groups. Uh, Ki of R. So here you only put this from chi zero. That like some kind of convention. Well, no, I mean, some of the high homotopy groups are automatically somewhat invertible. Because it's, yeah. <coughs> so if you have an object in here, then it actually has some kind of inverse map. Uh. Yeah, so, so I never understood really the plus construction or the Q construction, but I find this very intuitive that this is the right thing to do. Um, and when I talk, tell this to number series, they don't seem to know this. When I tell it to algebraic topologists, they tell me that, of course, this is a way to think about K-series. <laughs> um, anyway, so 
uh, okay, so that's the algebraic case here of a ring. And now uh, maybe uh, I want to generalize this to schemes. And I mean, there are different ways of doing this. And I will take a route that's maybe, if you want to set up the theory, not the right way to do it. Because to prove the following theorem, you or I need some of the machinery that would anyway define the case here of a general scheme. But uh, for expository reasons, this I think, OK. So there's a theorem of Thomas and Trubbo that's the association uh, that takes any ring R commutative <laughs> now um, to its K-theory. That this is it's a risky sheaf <laughs> of spaces. In the, well, in, in sheaf in the in the some derived sense of spaces. <laughs> but doesn't in his papers he always works with things of finite full dimension to <coughs> avoid the. Uh, yeah. So. Yes. So when you talk about sheaves of spaces, you have to be careful. There's a notion of a sheaf and there's a notion of a hypercomplete sheaf, which has to do with some convergence issues. And I only claim it's a sheaf. I don't claim it's a hypercomplete sheaf. And back then, Thomas and Trouble didn't really have the technology to talk about non-hypercomplete sheaves. But the theorem is true in general. It's a non-hypercomplete sheaf. It's also an Ishnevich. Yeah? Would you use the non-connective uh, K-theory? No, a I've... Yeah, so I'm only... For this talk, I will only consider connective K-theory because it's good enough for what I will do. Let me just add the remark that E infinity groups on spaces are actually the same thing as connective spectra. Yes. And there is a kind of version to actually define some kind of non-connective spectrum whose connective cover is this thing. And then this statement would even be true for the non-connective version. But uh, let me stick to the this okay, connective so thing. The non-connective part don't matter for the ship property because they right. So they don't give you rise to. No, so it's it's a limit, and so, and so if you have a sheaf of non-connective things, then the connective cover is a sheaf of non is a sheaf of connective things. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, but this makes it reasonable, uh, so maybe I should make a warning, a very important warning, uh, that it's not an Intel sheaf. And really, a lot of the mystery of K-theory is contained in the question to what extent K-theory does satisfy its all descent. So for example, all these kind of bloch carter conjectures are very much related to this. <coughs> okay, but uh, if you have any sheaves, then it's clear how to globalize on a scheme. So uh, if X is a scheme, I define the case here of X to some of these global sections on well, the Sarisky topology of X, so on the topological space of some of the K theory pre sheaf. Let me just call it K. And uh, let me also define a tall K theory. So this coincides for not under some. This co it coincides with the actual K theory if, if the Octonus and Trobo are assuming the. No, this always co coincides with the K theory of perfect complexes on X. But as we said, the, the convergence thing works for, for some. Uh, do do R gamma. There was this. Uh, I mean, I might maybe want you to assume that X is Q C Q. Bugger, do I need this? No, I don't. It's certainly, I don't need any finite dimensional assumptions. For the gamma? Not even for the gamma. So, if you read Lurie's higher topos theory, uh, there is a way to define this even for non-hypercomplete sheaves. What global sections are? There's a complete theory of sheaves of spaces or anything like this, without hypercompleteness imposed. 
Right. Something, but they needed some condition which is slightly weaker than materiality, but it's it's still some condition. So right. So so dealing with this type of. Problem. That's why part of the reason that high topo theory is such a great book. Okay, I mean, <laughs> uh, you can make sense of this. Um, I also want to define a tall case theory as the global sections on the tall side. So this is something different. It's some of the tall sheafification of the theory. Okay. Um, So, uh, the first thing that, that was then pretty well understood about case theory is what it looks like analytically, so after LA completion, uh, at least what as concerns the tall theory. Um, so, uh, what do I mean by analytic here? So, if I have any If I have any infinity group in spaces, uh, I can define its LID completion and some of the limit of A mod L to the N. All operations taken in the derived sense as they must because other operations don't make sense here. <coughs> Um, and so this itself will again be in infinity group right in spaces. In particular, itself it's a space and it has homotopy groups. Um, and understanding the tall K theory, um, okay, now there are some convergence issues coming up, but it basically reduces uh, to the study of the uh, for strictly and zillion local rings. And the structure for strictly and zillion local rings uh, is given by a theorem for Suslin, and I think maybe in most generality there's something due to Gubber. Um, so assume that R is a strictly and zillion local ring. And L is invertible on R. Uh, then you can actually compute this thing. So then the homotopy groups of the case theory of R analytically completed. Uh, which is a two periodic thing and basically looks like a uh, topological case theory of the, the complex numbers. So what it is, it's ZL and then there's a tate twist coming up, twisted by I over 2 if I is even and 0 else. Okay, and a corollary of this, and now there are some finiteness assumptions on X in order to make some of these convergence issues go away that we just discussed. So there are certain finiteness hypotheses on X. Um, So in general, if you have uh, 
<coughs> the global sections of a spectrum, there's some kind of local to global spectral sequence, or at least under convergence conditions there is, which goes from the cohomology groups of the homotopy sheaves uh, to the global thing. And the sheaves you can understand if you understand their values at the local rings. So they are just given by these uh, tail twists. And so, I uh, find this hypothesis on X. They exist on kind of local to global spectral sequence. Uh, and I will probably get my indexing wrong. So it starts with the tall cohomology of all the tail twists and converges to the homotopy groups of the tall LAK CPR bar. Sorry, X. We don't use the connective. Okay, clearly, so you have some hope you need to make Right, so this is if i plus j is greater or equal to zero. And something funny else that I don't want to say anything. So, but you take j to be positive uh, in the... Uh, so, i and j... So I guess i is greater or equal to j is greater or equal to zero in this mixing. But uh, I probably have the... You can have the Joseph is the non-connective one and get some... <coughs> uh, well, no, 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 excuse me, I, I'm stupid. Usually they invert the both are here. You know? yeah, yeah, so uh, so far I haven't converted the bot element. I will want to do this in a second, okay? But uh, um, because you understand uh, the case here is tricky and z in local rings, uh, at least most of your convergent issues, this gives away you a way to compute this at all case theory. Uh, in practice, you actually want slightly finer statements uh, where it becomes unnecessary to take the tall sheafification. And uh, the first such theorem was proved by Thomason. Uh, so, would like a better statement. Not involving a toxification. Um, and so, uh, for this, you uh, want to invert the bot element. And there is a way to even to say this without having a bot element. Um, but I want to do it in a way where I have a bot element. So for simplicity, assume uh, that X lives over the ring Z where you join all L power roots of, L power roots of unity. Um, then by the relation between the K1 of a ring and units, uh, there's a way to define a bot element, which will then live in pi 2 because in this other completion there's some Tate module coming up. So there is a bot element, it's called this beta L, uh, living in pi 2 of the case here of X, L equally completed. And can invert it. Um, and so, oh, there's something in topology called the K1 localization, which implicitly depends on your prime L. And this doesn't depend on the choice of a bot element or anything, uh, but a concrete way to compute this is to take the K-theory of R. Uh, well, to get my bot element, I already have to periodically complete. 
converts a bot element. And I guess this needn't be already complete again, so I probably have to do it again. <coughs> okay. So, ah, LK1 is defined for what? So, uh, uh, so that's defined for any s spectrum. And K1 means something about. <laughs> yeah, so there's things called Morava K series, K of N, and K of 1 is basically just topological K series. And then there's a way to localize at these things. Um, it's just that there is an intrinsic way which doesn't depend on any of these choices of defining this thing, but which concretely just means invertible. So this doesn't use a multiplicative structure of K of R? It, no, it only uses the additive structure. And in Thomason, I believe it defined it using powers of the both elements, which always believe that Right, yeah. OK. And so uh, there's the theorem of Thomason. That again, under some uh, finiteness hypothesis on X that I don't want to spell out. It was only that the fields are kind of special type because you had some way to. It's part of the finiteness hypothesis. So, I mean, he needs to assume that there is some fi kind of finite Galois cohomological dimension things for space fields and so on. Yeah. Right. Um, so, the precise hypothesis on Thomas are actually a pain to write down. Um, let me not do it. Uh, because anyway, the second I want to talk about PID K theory. So, uh, and I said I only talking about on connective covers in this talk, and so the statement I want to make is only on connective covers. Um, it's actually true that the tall K theory of R, uh, I can complete it, is the same thing as this K1 localization of the K theory of R. All right, X. <coughs> so this is something for which you really need to know the tall side of X. This is something for which you only need to know the case theory of X itself. And then you just invert the bot element and then you get this. Um, so there's a certain map that goes from the LLA Tate module on K1 of X to here. Just for any spectrum, there is some uh, uh, the LA Tate module uh, contributes to the LA completion one degree higher. And uh, in here, see some, uh, in K1 of X, in particular, have all the units in X. And so, in particular, the system of one zeta L, zeta L squared, lives in here. And that's my, I mean this maps to. OK, and uh, so this had an application uh, so there's the following theorem of Thomason and then find by Gabber uh, where again in the strictly in the local case so let R be in strictly in the local ring L invertible. Or I should say that this is the theorem is what was known as Grotendieck's purity conjecture. Um, in the tau cohomology. So then you can look at the, the tau cohomology groups with support. Ah, oh, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Regular. Of course I can. And also maybe it's this one here. Uh. Sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry, now I forgot to write regular. Uh, then you can look at the cohomology with supports on 
uh, maximum ideal on the tau side of ZL. And uh, this is a very simple answer. It's ah, and dimension D. This is ZL twisted by uh, minus D, if I is 2D, and it's zero else. So this is an application of this machinery of algebraic case theory to a very uh, classical question in a tau cohomology. D is the dimension of R? Hmm? D is the dimension of R? D is the dimension, yeah. Here is the point that we need for finite type, but then it's more general. I mean, this in particular also does a mixed characteristic case. No, no, ah. only the mixed characteristic case was a problem right. because the, the equal ah. one, there are much more, I mean, you can just use uh, like Popescu theorem to reduce. Right, so you can use Popescu theorem to reduce the finite type smooth, and then there it's more clear. But one of my first papers, I used this critically. Um, I used this theorem critically in one of my first papers. Uh, so uh, let me just give you a very vague idea of how this is done. Uh, so you, you use the following thing that you can also look at the cohomology with support at the maximal ideal. So let me write x for spec. Well, let me just write spec r here. Um, and this means Sarisky. Uh, it's a K series spectrum. Uh, this is just the K series of little k, so k is the residue field. Uh, so this is a version of Quillen's Divisage theorem. And you use this at R is regular. But then this applies, implies the same thing for uh, after K1 localization. I mean, inverts the bot element. Which you have in this case because you're strictly in zero. And, uh, and then the left hand side is computed. in terms of all the local cohomologies on the tau side of all possible tate twists. And the right-hand side uh, is simply ZLJ in degree. Yeah, this is what Thomason did. Right? This is what Thomason did. And so then you have a problem that there's actually some spectral sequence coming up. And the spectral sequence essentially degenerates by using evidence operations. So I can use evidence operations. Uh, to essentially isolate uh, individual t twists. But then there is some kind of bounded torsion coming up. And then Gubber found a way to get around this. All right. Okay, so uh, 
uh, now I would like to say something about peer decay theory. And what I will say here, uh, this relies on uh, joint work with uh, Butt and Morrow, uh, in our second paper. And uh, plus separate work of Clausen, Matthew, and Morrow. Well, Matthew is not the first name of Morrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so let me say what the, the goal of uh, <coughs> what we're doing here is. So we want to have an analog of this uh, relation. So we want to have a description of a tall case theory in terms of a generalization of the notion of Tate with some mixed characteristic. So R is some rather general ring. And P this time is not invertible on R. And actually, because you can always understand a ring usually in terms of the ring where P is inverted and the ring where it's periodic completed, we will only in a second actually assume it's periodic complete. Um, uh, we want to define certain etal sheaves, <coughs> technically actually sheaves of complexes, um, <coughs> some tate with CP of j, j greater or equal to zero, uh, I mean on <coughs> the etal side of R, say. Um, uh, such that there is a spectral sequence which goes from these uh, cohomology groups and converges. Well, again, it takes a tall case here of R and P can complete it, and that's by in positive degrees and something I don't want to say anything about in other degrees. And, uh, well, the, the first state with other things we know and love. So ZP of zero should, of course, just be ZP. And I mean, there's this usual issue that ZP is not really a sheaf on the etal side. And there are many ways to get around this. Uh, and of course, ZP of 1 should just be the Tate module of ZP infinity. <laughs> yeah, so say use the pro etal side. You weren't complaining when I did it there. So. Yeah, I mean, I could, I, I think Ike's alt theory, for example, is also general enough to handle this. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the way we actually set it up is uses the Freud house side. Uh, <coughs> so I should make the remark that there is previous work on this. Uh, So, and coming from kind of two different schools. So there is a kind of motivic school. Uh, so maybe Wojewodski, but ac more precisely actually Bloch. And then maybe worked out by Geiser and Levine. Uh, so they're in a situation where R is maybe smooth over DVR. And they use, uh, Log side char groups or something like this. Uh, and they don't actually get etal sheaves, so they get Sariski sheaves or need Snevich sheaves. Uh, and the spectral sequence. Uh, 
converging to K-theory itself. Not the tau K-theory. And then there is a kind of different school. Uh, I mean, starting with the work of Fontaine and Messing. And then there's been the work of Schneider and uh, Sato. Uh, where maybe R is semi-stable over DVR. So that's in particular the work of, I mean, I guess I should also mention Suji and, uh, I maybe mean can, some kind of logarithmic singularities. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, they use these some kind of symptomic complexes. And they, they certainly get uh, etal sheaves, um, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure how much is known in this case about the relation to case theory. Maybe in this, you all have some results there. Right, so right, so in this approach, there often is a restriction on the degrees in which you can do this. And as you get to a larger and larger tape twists, you usually have to invert more and more powers of larger and larger powers of P have to be. Um, so what we want to do is should really works completely integrally and for all tape twists. Uh, but I mean there's been such series by, I mean, Schneider and Sato in particular, they have something I think which works integrally and should give the correct answer. Um, okay, so I should say what my assumptions on R are, uh, under which we can do something like this. So I always assume that R is periodically complete. And also maybe what Bob was calling bounded, meaning that the this torsion is bounded. Oh, yeah. For technical reasons having to do with taking lots of theory completions. Um, but as I said, some, uh, in general, understanding this should reduce your understanding it after inverting P and on the PID completion. Uh, so we're someone doing, doing the thing which is completely orthogonal to the previous work. Um, uh, but we need one important assumption on our ring, which is that we call quasi syntomic. Uh, and if R is in Syrian, that's just equivalent to saying it's a local complete intersection. Right. I mean, there's this, I think, standard, I mean, fixed notion of a local complete intersection ring. It means that the completions of the local rings are uh, quotients of regular rings by, by a regular sequence. Quasi syntomic uh, is just a condition about the cotangent complex. So, in general, this means that if I take the cotangent complex of R over ZP, and I appear complete, then it's P complete tau amplitude. Uh, is contained in <coughs> minus one zero. Where one way to say what P complete tau amplitude is, uh, is just saying that if you, I mean, tau amplitude means that if you tensor with any uh, module, then the derived tensor product will live in these degrees. Mm -hmm. And here you're just allowing yourself to tensor with P torsion modules. <coughs> anyway, since you're pretty complete, maybe it's a. Uh, Ah, it's just a question on, on mod, the mod P or yes, It's just a question on the mod P thing, yeah. Uh, 
as an as a R. Ah, you complete periodically as an R, but you want it to be an R. Right? It's complete of R. <coughs> but when you derive complete periodically, or that's why I make a this assumption. Um, so, in particular, this includes all perfectoid rings. Uh, so. And all s rings which are somewhat formally smooth over perfectoid rings and stuff like that. Um, okay, so now I can uh, give our definition or actually a slight variant of our definition uh, of these state twists um, using the prismatic side. And so if you have an object AR, AI, and the prismatic side of R, and here I'm using the absolute prismatic side of R, so I'm simply allowing. So this means that this is a prism plus a map. Well, from spec A mod R to spec R, which means a map from R to A mod I. Um, then you can define an Eigert filtration. n greater or equal to j of a. So this is a set of all elements x and a, such that Dagger was using this phi symbol. This lies in i to the j, which is a subset of a. This is a sub module of a. So if you did this in uh, um, in the kind of crystalline case where I is actually generated by P, then in small degrees this agrees with the divided power filtration, but in large degrees it doesn't. Uh, so that's part of the reason that our theory works better in large degrees. <coughs> but the divided power filtration is somehow something that, well, it only depends on divided power structure, but this really needs the Frobenius on them. So the crystalline case is like what was explained in the previous talk that is you... Well, by crystalline, I just mean that I is generated by P. So these are some of the things that come up if you do the prismatic story in characteristic P. And where it's closely related to the crystalline story. Um, and so uh, we have a map uh, kind of divided for Benius. Uh, let's call this phi jet. Plug of use this symbol. Uh, I would like to say it goes from A to A, and it's just given by uh, phi divided by D to the J. Uh, but I can't quite say this because I don't have, in general, a generator for my ideal I. Uh, there is a way to get around this by introducing these Proikisian twists. Uh, So these are trivial I as principle. So you say it's phi divided by? Uh, this distinguished element to the J. So if I trivialize I, uh, then for a certain choice of distinguished element, that I used to do this, uh, this will just be phi equal to D to the J. So you put the same twist on both sides? I put the same twist on both sides, yeah. So in particular, there's also a canonical map somewhere. So there is like inclusion still. And, uh, and why you cannot eliminate it? The twist is like tensor in this i to j. It's almost tensoring with i to the j, except that the Broekhusen twist over a is slightly more complicated to write down, and I don't want to do it. But I think it's just tensoring by i to the j. So unfortunately, writing down the Broekhusen twist over a is like I don't understand it so well, but there's a way to do it. Um, <coughs> Uh, 
And so the definition is that if I take my sheaf CP of j and I evaluate it on my r, then it's given by the cohomology on the prismatic side of r of the following complex. So this is supposed to be some kind of mixed characteristic version of the Artin trial sequence uh, that that first of all works in mixed characteristic, but second of all works for all k-twists. And there is some kind of, at least philosophical, resemblance to these kind of motivic, uh, symptomic complexes. Hmm? R is quasi-symptomic, yeah. And so the theorem that follows from combining the works that I said, is that the spe spectral sequence well, I guess this is what I just called well, it's the cohomology groups of this complex uh, converging to tell case of RFP completed Uh, exists. And secondly, in degree zero and one, we recover what we want. Right, cohomology, is that the prismatic cohomology then? Yeah, maybe I should have. No, it's just the cohomology of this complex. Sorry. I mean, ah. so ZP of G is a sheaf of complex which associates to any R this value, ZP of J of R. And so then, well, the global sections are just the same again. Okay. Satisfies so it totally. Uh, I HR plus JR minus I HI minus JR ZPJ is. <coughs> <coughs> is it the uh, tal cohomology or square car with values in or it just Well th this thing it turns out to satisfy tall descent, this association okay. of mapping R to this thing. And then this is well it's just the cohomology groups of this complex. Okay, okay. And R delta is provided with this topology with which topology? You don't actually need to put any topology on this. Uh, you could put the Zariski topology somewhere on A mod on A. Ah. So why do you write R gamma R del? Well, it's just the limit over all objects on the side of this. Ah, this is the... the, the uh, sorry, I mean... Ah. This is the side of uh, what is R delta? I, R delta is the side of all these objects. All pairs A comma I, the map from R to A mod I. And then to any A, I can associate this complex and I can tell take the limit. So maybe don't like this. I can also write the limit of all maps from R to A mod I. <coughs> but uh, when you define certain things, you assume that uh, uh, ah, those things are defined in general. Or any the W. Right, so these things are just. Are defined without any assumption they're bounded. And no, no, don't need any. Uh, this is just an assumption on R, not on the. I don't think I need to put it on the prism right here. Um, I 
Should I give sketches this or should I say something about uh, what I want to use this for? Well, let me give a very, very, I mean, by the theorem of Clausen, Matthew, and Morrow, uh, this can be computed in terms of something else called the topological cyclic homology of R. And so there has been long known in algebraic topology there is a mass certain map here called the cyclotomic trace. And this turns out to be an isomorphism here. <coughs> and then what we do in this BMS2 paper is analyze this topological cyclic homology and show that it admits this description in terms of these complexes. So this is actually the homotopy fiber. So this is a, a paper of Nicolaus and myself, uh, that one way to describe this is to take something called TC minus of R. Okay, completed. Sorry, it's very equal. Oh, let's say home to fiber. And then there's certain there's a certain phi map and a certain identity map going to something called TP of R. Maybe again, okay, completed. And uh, this here. Uh, can be described, and this is some of BMS2, this is described in terms of this kind of n greater or equal to j. Well, you just write n greater or equal to j of prism, where prism is <coughs> some of the global sections of that left term. And maybe there's this twist. And this here is described. in terms of these prism j's. So there's quite a bit of work into going into this. Uh, And something else that uh, Clausen, Matthew, and Morrow give to you uh, is a way to describe the difference between the K theory and the Etal K theory. So they tell you how far they actually are from each other, and they give you many situations where they're actually the same. So, the, in some sense, the analog of the other step uh, that after inverting the bot elements, these are the same, that's also understood. So, again, by CML. We know pretty well how far they are from each other. Okay, um, I think I started a bit late, so I think I still have maybe three, four minutes. Um, hmm? <laughs> uh, uh, so let me say something about a potential application of this. So it's joined. Uh, with Chesnovichius and progress. Um, and again, it's a to see these kinds of local cohomology questions. And so <coughs> it's about having analogs of the local cohomology things where now some L is not anymore invertible on the characteristic. So uh, let's put ourselves again in the situation of a strictly local uh, Hanseian ring. Strictly local ring. Uh, sorry, why is the Hanseian? Um, and this time, it doesn't. It turns out that being regular doesn't help so much. So, I, and what turns out to be the better assumption is that it's a local complete intersection. And uh, let's say we have any finite flex group scheme over R. Commutative, of course. Z 
then if I look at the cohomology with supports on M, let's say, now that I have finite fact coefficients, I got to use F PPF cohomology on G. Uh, ah, so uh, dimensions equal to G. Uh, then this is zero for I less than D. So let me make some remarks about this. So this is the same bound as for Curie and cohomology. <coughs> and in this uh, situation where maybe G is FP or something, then by Artin Schreier and R is of characteristic P, then the FP cohomology is closely related to coherent cohomology by the Artin Schreier sequence. So you would rather expect your bounds to be close to the bounds you see in coherent cohomology, which already means that you can't expect something like twice D to appear here because this is not at all what happens in the coherent setting. Um, it's easy if the order of G is invertible on R. And, uh, I mean, there's probably some F and left, left shades or something entering this, but uh, maybe there's some work of cover entering. That's just read okay. Yeah? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and uh, then a very interesting case is if G is just a um, mu p. So this implies the following two results. So it implies that if D is at least three, and by U R I always denote the punctured spectrum, uh, then any torsion line bundle <coughs> on U R is trivial. And if D is at least four, then the broad group of U R is zero. And these are actually conjectures of Gabber. Okay, and so last backboard. What can you say if G is alpha P? Just do this. From, uh, well, then you can probably relate it to GA, right? So that should be okay. <coughs> and so this actually, uh, having this statement about the broad group here, actually, because it proves this, uh, reproves this result about the purity of the broad group, that if you have a regular scheme and you remove something of put dimension at least two, then the broad group doesn't change, which was recently proved by Kistutis. Um, and he only had to prove something dimension at least four, but there actually you don't need the regular assumption, you should only need the complete intersection assumption, as Gubber conjectured. And, uh, okay, so our theorem uh, is that if R is either P torsion free or PR is equal to zero, so we have characteristic P, and G is either Z mod PZ or mu P, uh, then the conjecture holds. <coughs> okay. Let me stop here. Mm, question? Yeah. So that's quite a weak in generality, the conjecture. That to the so I mean, is that, that's your conjecture? Or? Actually, I told you this is a bit used for the case of Z would be a Sorry, what you After you're talking on saying in January, I told you it's reasonable to conjecture this for new to Z. Yeah, but here it's for energy. For so right. energy, I was not sure that it should go. Yeah, so we expect that there's some kind of general version of Diodonet the theory in this kind of setting where you should be able to write any G in terms of some similar such complex where some of the Fibinius something. And if there was such a theory, 
Due to naysayer in the setting, the, the argument should work for a general finite flat group. Okay. Well, also, in this one can somehow use the scalars to just repeat eventually. What did you say? Can somehow use so in small degrees, you can sometimes reduce to restrictions of scalars of mu p and uh, stuff. So what is the definition of the uh, of the ball case in this setting? Uh, so I do. Yeah. Uh, okay. So chip, chip, chip. Rockies in twist. Um. Uh, so let me define ir to be the product of i, phi of i, up to phi to the r minus 1 of i. <coughs> then what will happen is that if I take the broad Keesian twist and mod it out by ir, then it is given by ir mod ir squared. And in general, the whole thing can be recovered from the inverse limit of this, but you have to be careful to define the correct transition maps here. So there are some kind of obvious transition maps just because IR is contained in IR minus 1, but you need to divide this by P. You need to divide this by P, this transition map. And uh, A1 a, a is what? Is it a finite? It's, it's, a, uh, it's an invertible A module. And uh, the general ones are tensor powers? And the general ones are just tensor powers of it, yeah. Yeah, I also have a question on the thing, or maybe I don't know if you want to, it should be. So the, you mentioned this uh, R gamma, the thing about K theory, that uh, the K theory of perfect complex that you claim is in general R gamma of the, of in the sense of glory, I don't know this, the, the sense, but it's a, I suppose it's a generalization of taking hypercomology of com unbounded below complexes. Not hypercomology, that's the thing. Oh, well, okay, so yeah, yeah, some kind of, yeah. Mm? yeah, yes, okay, yeah. But, but now, in general, you can compute it using the hyper covering, but if you are able No, 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 you are only allowed to use nerves of Czech coverings now. That's some of the difference. You're not allowed to do hyper coverings. But you can always find some kind of finite succession of nerves of Czech covers which reduce everything to the affine case, if you have at least a QCQS scheme. Ah, so the definition of the L gamma uses only nerves of Czech covers? Right. I mean, first you can do this for separated schemes, and you just take any uh, affine cover by um, any open affine cover, and then the Cheshire nerve also is just affine. And so then all the terms are already defined, you can take the limit. And then for a general scheme, at least the intersections are again quasi complex and separated, and so it's defined for them. And so then, in finitely many steps, you can get okay, to so any QCQS scheme. scheme. So does, the, is this R gamma, does this R gamma generalize the cohomology of unbounded below complexes like? Uh, uh, no, Schwarzenstein, I think everything is hyper complete. But I mean, yeah, I mean, if you restrict to hyper complete object, it, that it gives the same answer. That's also true. Okay, maybe we'll maybe it has to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> so, I guess